Uh, an auditor has just completed a physical security audit of a data center. Because the center engages in top secret defense contract work, the auditor has chosen to recommend biometric authentication for workers entering the building, which is the best recommendation listed here. I just look at the answers and I see replace the current system. Okay, that's for A. Replace the current system for B. Are you going to have a better system by replacing the current system? Well, no, because they are, well, they're supplementary. They're supplementary. So I, I think we can very easily uh, remove A and B, even though you know, they, they talk about face recognition and fingerprint recognition. Those are, you know, those are very good answers by themselves, but I don't think we should be replacing any system. It's so-called two-factor authentication when you're having several different systems. Now, supplement the current radio frequency badge identification with a password verification system. Hmm. Well, first of all, you're recommending biometric authentication for the workers. Is password verification system biometric? No, it's not. I think that's relatively obvious. However, the last one supplements the current system and adds uh, iris uh, an iris uh, recognition system. So I think we, we all agree on this one. Okay, which of the following would be appropriate to consider in the physical design of a data center, inclusion of an uninterruptible power supply system and surge protection? That sounds promising. Uh, B, design of authorization tables for operating system access. In fact, I think here we're, you really have to understand uh, what it's not. And, and, and I, think, I think the answer is easy. But what about those other things? I'm going to give a little bit of an explanation on, say, authorization tables, because it's also good knowledge. Uh, C, replacement of a badge and password system with a new biometric access system. That doesn't sound good, because it's a replacement of one system with another. And you wouldn't consider you know, weakening the security. Uh, though I can say that, you know, say our password system on our phones have been often replaced when it works with the biometric access system. So you can either show your face or put a password. And of course, that might in some ways, you know, giving two possibilities, you know, on, on my current phone, it actually weakens it. Maybe, you know, so someone, you know, directly you know, puts uh, my phone against my face uh, and, and in some ways I don't notice, well, they've already accessed, have been able to access my phone, huh? Uh, D, evaluation of potential risks from remote hackers. That doesn't seem to be part of the physical design. So let's look at the answers here. Indeed, you're absolutely right. For the physical design part, it, it's part of that. For the authorization tables, you should still know about this, but it, it's not really part of the question. Authorization tables for operating system access and evaluation of risk from remote hackers are a way to address logical controls. And we're going to see that right after, what logical controls means, but not physical controls. The center's physical location, the characteristics of the environment in which it operates, and the design of the physical data center as systems such as backup and emergency systems are appropriate considerations. We're now looking at access and authorization controls, and we're just going to start with a few definitions right at the beginning. Identity access management, so IAM is the common abbreviation. It includes policies and different technologies as well to ensure that the right users have appropriate access rights. Two things here. One, there has to be a means of knowing who the right users are. This is not easy, huh? And have appropriate access rights. Let me put that as the second thing. So determining the proper access rights is a second important consideration. What about logical access control? So Logical access controls are how computers identify authorized users. I mean, when you try to recognize a person, it is definitely not a logical access control in the computer sense. But when different, say, biometric systems, when different password systems, when different 
control access systems, try to identify authorized users, they will use so-called logical access controls. Now the little concept of privileged accounts. Privileged accounts are accounts with increased access rights. For instance, to administer the rights themselves or view restricted information. So I've, I've seen the word say, you know, super administrator. A super administrator can determine the access rights for other people. Indeed, just imagine, you know, your, your little, you know, enterprise resource planning ERP system. If your accountant were a super user, they would have so-called privileged account access and would be able to, you know, give to themselves or anyone else any access rights. And in fact, some of the privileged account accesses, especially to determine the rights, should be so incredibly restricted as to, you know, having just a very, very few number of people often in management uh, to be able to you know determine those rights and often not just with one person but with two people validating let's look at some of the risks and i've drawn an impact not likelihood uh, an impact not likelihood chart simply because if i put in the likelihood we're going to see that the likelihood of some of these are often extremely remote but the impact of some of these can be you know, extremely high as well. So a, a first risk on access and authorization controls is access to confidential information by inappropriate employees. We're now looking at the employees. So this is still problematic because say if you know, your, your accountant gets access to you know, a, a bank account information, you know, he, he might be able to make inappropriate transfers. Or, you know, if employees who are not supposed to, you know, know about, say, your confidential, uh, you know, prototype project, or say about the planned merger or acquisition, then they might be able to use that for insider trading. And indeed, it should be restricted to just the people that need to know the information and not more. One of the tests that you know, I've, I've done pretty much on every single time I've looked at information security, which uh, starting now is, is a lot, one test I've done every single time is simply to know who has access to you know, some, so, some sensitive network or you know, network drives or, say, applications. An example of this is who has access to your treasury drive? So it, it, both internally, you know, to, to any organization, you know, they have access to the bank accounts and things like that. Or if you're talking about a financial sector institution, who has access to the different transactions, say, for clients. But if the wrong person would have access to that, then, you know, it can still be extremely problematic for you know, many of the reasons discussed. I would still put it at the lower end of risks, but I would, if, if I were to include likelihood here, I would include it at one of the highest likelihoods of, uh, you know, of, of risks themselves. Second of all, access to confidential information by suppliers or clients. So less likely, but this can be more problematic because, well, indeed, you can you know, control uh, your suppliers or your clients a lot less. There might be some, you know, reputational risks, especially with uh, clients if they have access to information, maybe embarrassing information they're not supposed to know about. And so it is. It, it could have a higher impact, but indeed maybe lower likelihood. Uh, installation of malicious software. Okay, here we're getting into, you know, really the the the, the malicious, the devious, uh, different things that can happen to your system. Sadly, the installation of malicious software is sadly not that low a likelihood. It's not that low a likelihood uh, from you know, what I've seen to actually have computer networks that are breached in different ways. You, know, you, you, you click a link, but maybe that link was sent to you know, 100,000 different users, uh, 100,000 different people you know, around the world. It can be a million different people around the world. And so 
you know, people are sent these malicious links all the time. Often, an organization doesn't need to be directly targeted uh, for, for there to be problems. It can simply be, you know, malicious software, which is sent to many different people. We're talking about problems like, you know, a, a user who is allowed to install an application, even say a browser extension on their, you know, work browser, then there could be malicious content on that that could get onto the computer network. Modification, destruction, or encryption of data. So less likely, but not as unlikely as you might think. There have been a lot of uh, ransomware attacks in uh, recent times, and I think it's only going to grow. Uh, there could be modification of your data or destruction. So I would say this is a bit less likelihood, uh, a, a bit, this would be a bit less likely because honestly cyber criminals care maybe less about, you know, modifying or destroying your data. That might just be kind of an act of vandalism. I think they care about something that will actually give them a profit in the future. Uh, breaches of privacy and reputational risks. So I would put this at the high impact end, in fact, the, the extremely high impact end for some of these reputational risks, because when firms get targeted, it's quite embarrassing. Honestly, it's quite embarrassing when it gets known, you know, they, they, they have to tell that to all their shareholders. So, you know, management is, uh, you know, under, under fire from this kind of thing as well. Um, it, it can be extremely embarrassing when organizations, you know, have breaches to the privacy of their employees or the reputational risk. When it comes to the privacy, they can have a full you know, host of legal and reputational and in fact regulatory risks as well due to say you know, uh, you know, GDPR in Europe uh, and uh, different privacy frameworks that can make it you know, extremely problematic when private user data is breached. Finally, theft of high value information. So I would say this is on the low likelihood part, but definitely extremely high impact part. If you are, you know, if, if you have extremely valuable information and it's a lot more than you might think, it might be, you know, uh, in the US it might be social security cards. Those uh, can, can allow you to say open bank accounts and things like that, that can be problematic. But when we're looking at Europe, it might be, uh, or you know, rest of the world for for that matter, it might be more things about you know proprietary data, or you know access to different information that your competitors would like to know about, say about financial information, which a in a trader, not exactly an inside trader, but a trader with access to privileged information would be able to use for you know fraudulent purposes. Now we look at identity access management. So, of course, we saw the definition before, but let's see what kind of activities identity access management actually includes. And there are three different steps to it with different, uh, let's call it sub-steps. Huh? Provisioning involves providing and terminating access rights. That's to say, in an IAM system, of course, the first thing you think about is think about you know, being able to give access, and of course at the end, about terminating those different accesses. This is called provisioning. An important consideration, of course, is your segregation of duties between the approvers and the users, and it should definitely be ensured according to you know, some of the criteria that we saw earlier in the course about segregation of duties. A often forgotten thing is that obsolete rights should also be removed. So when auditing some of the information systems, and in fact pretty much every time I've audited an information system, what I've looked for was former employees. Former employees who would still have access rights. Because, think of it, some users might, you know, some employees might still be able to keep their phones, 
maybe even potentially their laptops or their access rights after they have been employed. And indeed, they might you know, be rather disgruntled with the company and the company you know, cannot control them or survey them in, in the same way as when they were employees. And so being able to terminate access rights, what I would do as a check as an internal auditor would be, okay, do they still have window access rights? Do they still have application access rights? Are the, some of these application access rights on a network? And then I would look into uh, you know, more details like, is this person an authorized signatory for bank accounts? Because if they're an authorized signatory for bank accounts, if they still have access to the payment system, if that means they still might be able to make payments on behalf of the organization. So you would definitely check that former employees, in fact, not just former employees, former suppliers, former third parties would no longer have any access to the company information. IAM administration involves so ensuring that policies and procedures are in place over IAM. So this is kind of the second step after provisioning. It's more of the administration part. We're trying to make sure that policies and procedures are in place, and we're going to try to, say, manage some standards over passwords. Remember, passwords have to be long, include numbers, and maybe characters. In fact, the longer they are, exponentially longer it can take. You know, uh, it goes up by a, um, a, a factor of 10 every time you, sorry, not a factor of 10. It, include, it, it, it goes up uh, stronger than a factor of 10 every time you add a character uh, or because this can include numbers, this can include uh, alphanumeric values, this can include different characters. So every digit that you add to a password can make it much, much more difficult for a, um, a, a system to be able to break into you know, your, your, your access. Uh, auditing and monitoring. And of course, this is kind of part of the IAM administration. There has to be a proper monitoring of the system. One good practice is that there be regular verifications on, on password strengths. Uh, that means there's often a kind of a database of passwords, of, of course, extremely well protected, and checks on that database to make sure that you know, they, they follow criteria. You, you can guess you can have standards over some of the passwords, such as, you know, they have to have eight characters, they have to be alpha numeric uh, plus characters plus numbers, but maybe you can't have simple things like, you know, name of company plus name of the year, which are just too easy to guess or to brute force attack. Uh, by the way, brute force attack is when a hacker tries every single combination of uh, you know, letter or password until the system finally unlocks it. it. It often works with kind of dictionary systems or common misspelling even, common misspellings even, so that you know, the, the system would be able to just try many, 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 many different passwords until it finally you know, gets one that will, will succeed successfully. So do not put your password as one, two, three, four, five. And especially do not put your password as one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are some of the most common. Uh, managing IAM systems is part of the IAM uh, administration as well. The third part of this is IAM enforcement. IAM enforcement involves the authentication, authorization of the different accesses. So First of all, IAM activities should be properly logged. We have an enforcement in place that means that there should be, you know, any access should have a whole system behind it to make sure that that uh, authorization is correct. And we're going to see a few of those techniques right now. But first of all, we're going to learn about passwords. Passwords are like toothbrushes. 
They're best when fresh and should not be shared. I found this somewhere. I think it's great. But also think that passwords should be complicated because every digit you add to them makes it so much more difficult to actually crack. And that's why, you know, that's why there are minimum lengths of passwords in many cases. Another type, we could say our second toothbrush here, is two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication requires two separate, distinct forms of identification in order to access something. In fact, simply say having two passwords would not be as strong as, say, having a password plus you know, a, a biometric control such as you know, thumbprint identification. 